So the reason that we're bullish on stocks and we think most investors are not bullish enough is because our expectation is that both real growth and inflation are going to accelerate in the coming months and quarters. And historically, if you look at how the stock market performs against historical backdrops like that, it's very, very well. We're talking double digit annualized returns easily. So the S&P 500 could be up 10 or 20% in 2024. Welcome to the Jay Martin Show. If you're new to the show, my name is Jay. I'm an investor. I'm here looking for the smartest home for my cash. If that sounds like you, then I think you're gonna like what we do here. My guest today is Mike Singleton, the Senior Analyst and Principal at Invictus Research. And today we got into where Mike is looking for opportunity and putting cash. So quite a bullish take. I really enjoyed today's interview. It was refreshing relative to a lot of the doom and gloom pundits that we tend to hear in macro finance. Uh, Mike has a pretty, pretty optimistic outlook for the equities market, for the housing market. Um, he's not really bearish on much right now, and he makes a sound case as to why, most importantly. So stay tuned for that. Right before we jump in, I host my annual conference in Vancouver, British Columbia on January 21st and 22nd, 2024. Only a week away, I believe at this point. This is an absolute behemoth of an event. Two days, six stages, over 60 keynote speakers and 240 investment opportunities in the trade show floor. Uh, an absolute um, Super Bowl of, uh, of finance commentary and an outlook focused on the commodity sector. So check out cambridgehouse.com if you'd like to pick up tickets to the event. It's called the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. Over 6,000 investors, January 21st and 22nd in Vancouver, BC. All right, here is Mike Singleton. Enjoy. All right, here I am with Mike Singleton. Mike, it's great to see you. Thanks for coming on the show. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, Jay. Okay, so a handful of directions I want to go today. Uh, you submitted some ideas in advance, one of which caught my attention because I asked you, you know, what subjects or topics are the public misunderstanding? And your response was, folks are not bullish enough which I thought it grabbed my attention because it's kind of counter to many of much of the sentiment that I hear from my guests. So let's start with that as a jump off period. What did you mean? Folks aren't bullish enough. What are you paying attention to? So uh, let me take a step back for a second and talk about our macroeconomic framework for viewing not just the economy, but also financial markets. Really, there are two major macroeconomic variables that drive financial markets like stocks and bonds and commodities and currencies, and they're real growth and their inflation. And if you get the direction of real growth and inflation right, you're going to end up getting a lot of other stuff right as well. And so the reason that we're bullish on stocks, and we think most investors are not bullish enough, is because our expectation is that both real growth and inflation are going to accelerate in the coming months and quarters. And historically, if you look at how the stock market performs against historical backdrops like that, it's very, very well. We're talking, you know, I, double digit annualized returns easily. So the S&P 500 could be up 10 or 20% in 2024, and it would be very, very consistent with history. So maybe I'll, I'll leave it there. And if you want to pull on any threads from, from what I just said, then happy to explain. Yeah, sure. So would you expect the same core, like five to seven companies to carry that rally? So if you're looking at, you know, double digit gains in 2024, S&P up 10 to 20%, you know, we know who's been carrying uh, the market, the S&P um, over the last year, 18, 24, 36 months, sort of five to seven names. Do you expect any shift in sentiment or rotation of capital into um, maybe real assets or or hard asset companies? Or do you think it's the tech winners that will win the day again? So I begin by saying in absolute terms, I'm not really bearish on anything within the stock market. So I would expect value stocks to perform well, growth stocks to perform well, mega cap tech to continue performing well, uh, but with more participation than last year. Last year, maybe the last week aside, it was pretty a pretty thin year in terms of market breadth or market participation. And I think that some important economic dynamics have changed over the last six weeks or so that are going to allow more transportation from, excuse me, more participation from value names like transport stocks, uh, industrials, basic materials, energy was a laggard in 2023. We think that could be a leader in 2024. Mm -hmm. So in short, not really bearish in anything, but expect broader participation in 2024. Okay. Now walk me through your real growth thesis, because if you're 
I, I think my audience will wrap their minds around the inflation thesis real quick, but the real growth thesis I'll have more questions about. So, so why are you bullish on real economic growth in 2024 when it's very easy to pick out a handful of macro trends that may lead you to say we're on the brink of a pretty steep recession? So I think that real growth is going to accelerate because there is a lot of pent up demand in the housing sector and the goods sector. And you can track that a lot of different ways. Total home sales are down 42% from their peak. The ISM manufacturing PMI has been negative signaling, or it's been below 50, which signifies negative manufacturing output growth for 14 consecutive months. Capacity utilization is down some 300 basis points from its cycle peak. So there is a lot of softness in the goods sectors and the, and the housing sector. And you have to ask yourself, well, why is there all this weakness? And it's a pretty easy answer. It's because we had almost 8% mortgage rates. We had more uh, interest rates across the US interest rate complex that were high and increasing for 18 months, right? And that completely froze up the housing market. About 50% of durable goods purchases, so think big, expensive, discretionary items that last longer than three years, cars, washing machines, furniture, home appliances, et cetera, about 50% of durable goods purchases are associated with new home purchases. So basically higher interest rates froze up a huge fraction of the economy. Interest rates are moving down again. If you believe that higher interest rates hurt the economy, then lower interest rates are going to stimulate it. And we think that that will be enough. The decline in interest rates that we've already seen, right from 8% mortgage rates to 6, 8 or wherever we're at now, you know, the 120 basis point decline will be enough to, to stimulate a reflationary impulse through the US economy that will result in faster real growth, but also faster inflation, like you just said. Okay. So your 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 high level outlook for like Fed funds rate for let's let's take that. You expecting flat down? Do you have an expectation? You know, I don't want to ask you for prediction if you don't uh don't have one, but what what's your what are your thoughts on the Fed funds rate for the the year? Fed funds rate is a, is, a, is a tricky one. I'd say I'm operating off of the base case that the that what the FOMC members are describing in their summary of economic projections is going to happen. So call it three cuts in 2024. Um, okay. That yeah. That said, it's not like a high quality. Or it's not a high conviction <laughs> thesis that I have on on short rates for that reason. I, I think that you know, I guess we could talk about how we want to position on the yield curve in, in more detail if you'd like. Um, but I think that generally most investors, especially equity focused investors, should be thinking about taking more risk and not less risk. Um, so the conversation about fixed income is really for people that can't invest outside of fixed income for this year, I think. Okay. Flipping to your inflation thesis, Mike, because I before, before we record, you said you think we're actually headed for for much faster inflation than we've seen in the past. If I gathered that correctly from your, okay, so walk me through what you're expecting on that front. So it's not it's not dissimilar to what I just said about real growth. So right now we're at two percent inflation core and headline. If you're looking at PCE in six month annualized terms, which is kind of what the Fed focuses on, right? So what, what's driving that 2% inflation? I think what it's masking is significant imbalances in the underlying economy. On the one hand, you have the goods economy, which is deflating at four or 5%, and you have energy inflation, which has been deflating even faster than that, because we've seen oil go from you know 130 to 70 over the last 18 months or so. And then on the other hand, you have services, which are inflating at four, five, five and a half percent. So that's not a sustainable dynamic, right? You can't have the goods economy deflating at four or five percent forever, and you probably can't have the services economy inflating at four or five percent if you want to see two percent inflation over time. So something has to give. Either services is going to follow goods, right, and we'll get deflation, which is essentially a recession scenario, or we're going to see reflation. We're going to see a normalization in the goods economy, which is going to push the headline and the core data back up toward the level of wage growth and the core services data right now. So call it inflation of three, three and a half, four, four and a half percent. Right now, our base case is reflation. We don't, we don't think that the conditions are in place for a recession from here. So our expectation is that we're going to see headline CPI, core CPI, headline PCE, core PCE gravitate toward around 4% by the end of this year. And really, that's not driven by anything special except for one, normalization in goods inflation and energy inflation, and two, the labor market remaining more or less resilient. 
and we can go through our, our logic for for each of those if you'd like yeah let's start with the labor market i'm curious so um a couple of things the first thing i would say is that in order to get a recessionary level of weakness in the labor market in order to get mass layoffs you really need to see business conditions um you have to have business owners seeing you have to have business owners believe that they have over invested in staff in human mm -hmm. capital relative to future demand with no line of sight into improvement right because businesses don't like to fire people laying off 25 or 30 percent of your workforce is a huge high friction decision and you're basically saying you're not going to hire people you're not going to hire that same quantity of people back anytime soon otherwise you wouldn't do it and hiring people is a very high friction process especially in developed countries right mm -hmm. it's expensive it takes a really long time there's you know a war for talent if you if you have good employees the last thing you want to do is let them go and so essentially you know the thesis is that conditions aren't that bad right when you talk to business owners when you look at survey work when you look at uh you know the numbers under the hood of the BLS data it doesn't look that bad it doesn't look bad enough that we think business owners are going to take dramatic action to reduce headcount in the next few months so to put another spin on this um something that's frequently ignored right now even though it's important or it's acknowledged but it's not um, discussed in detail is the fiscal deficit so why do we bring that up within the context of employment how does the fiscal deficit impact economic data right what's the connection between government spending and uh the economic data that you get from the bea or the bls or whatever every month the closest relationship is with the employment data so generally higher deficit mean it puts downward pressure on the unemployment rate it puts downward pressure on the unemployment rate it puts upward pressure on consumption data it puts upward pressure on inflation data and it puts upward pressure on interest rates which is a little bit of a separate conversation but right now the fed or i should say in 2023 the federal government of the us ran a deficit equal to six percent of gdp very very high really without any precedent outside of either wars or recessions in 2023 we, we really had neither so it was an un, it, the government was spending money as though there was an emergency of some kind even though of course there was no emergency and that supported the labor market supported wage growth you know it, it, it contribute it has contributed over the last few years to above target inflation um and i think there are a lot of people saying like okay that was the story for 2023 but according to the office of management and budget which is the office of the president uh <laughs> an office that has an incentive to make to make uh, forecasts favorable to the current administration the OMB is expecting the budget deficit to be 6.8 percent of GDP in 2024 so they expect the budget deficit to accelerate in the coming 12 months so what does that mean well it probably means there's going to be incrementally more downward pressure on the unemployment rate and more upward pressure on consumption data and more upward pressure on interest rates and all of that is consistent with our reflation thesis now the budget deficit isn't the only thing that matters but we're talking about between 1.5 and 2 trillion dollars of money being circulated into the U.S. economy and the you know the U.S. economy is only 27 trillion dollars so it ends up being really really important on the margins and so uh unless something really dramatic changes it's uh it's hard to imagine seeing a big increase in the unemployment rate in the near term yeah I, look that makes logical sense to me uh if you got the federal government spending like drunken sailors right there's more cash circulating around for the real economy to play with to borrow to spend exactly to, uh you could you could question the policy decision but the impact of it is uh is more cash in the economy if we want to grow the Canadian economy, we need people to invest, and that's what you're bringing people here to do. If you are serious about your investment portfolio in 2024, I will be hosting the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference at the World Class Vancouver Convention Center. I don't trust Wall Street. I trust me, gold, silver, and my jet. Six stages, 240 investment opportunities, and over 5,000 investors through the front door. Visit cambridgehouse.com for details what's your portfolio look like right now mike where are you putting cash where are you looking for opportunity um and are you playing more of a defensive game probably not it sounds like from what you shared thus far you're playing an offensive game but let, let me know 
Right. So I would say that incrementally, I think if you believe the reflation thesis that I just laid out, you have to be taking incrementally more risk. Mm -hmm. And so I'd say that means net exposure up. That means uh, overweighting cyclical sectors like industrials and financials and basic materials and energy and underweighting defensive sectors like utilities and consumer staples and healthcare. Again, I don't expect those sectors to have negative performance. I think they probably will have positive performance, but I think that they'll underperform. If you were to look at a ratio of cyclical equity sectors to defensive ones and overlay it on top of GDP or the ISM manufacturing PMI, they look very similar. And that's very intuitive. More cyclical <laughs> equity sectors and style factors have more exposure to the growth cycle. So when growth is accelerating and inflation is accelerating, you want to have more exposure to those themes within your portfolio. If you're a fixed income investor, you want to be taking incrementally more credit risk. Um, if you're an FX investor, you probably want to be looking at reflationary uh, currency exposures. So um, I think that the Australian dollar looks interesting, the Canadian dollar, even the South African rand looks pretty interesting. And if you're bullish on the South African rand, that, that means that <laughs> you must really believe there is a reflationary impulse uh, getting ready to sort of course through the global economy because that is truly a risk on currency. So one, one point of vulnerability that maybe I'll just bring up would be, you know, if I think where where are investors looking for the next uh, the next crack in the economy, specific to the U.S. economy, maybe? And consensus may fall on corporate real estate, commercial real estate, and banks' exposure to vacant buildings, banks' exposure to buildings in cities that have foot tra traffic that's just fallen off a cliff. Um, and, and this is the next uh, piece of smoke that's about to be a fire. But what's your take on the commercial real estate crisis? Is it a crisis? And if not, why not? Uh, and, and how do you see it? So the way I think about the possibility of a credit event of any kind is that it really depends on the labor market. And so, uh, you know, consumption is, is what drives a lot of corporate earnings, right? Pers consumption from the consumer and personal consumption expenditures are really driven by just two variables. One is employment and one is growth in wages and salaries, right? And if you had to pin down one that's really the most important, it's employment. You know, if employment breaks, you end up having uh, lower income growth or even negative income growth, less consumption. That means less corporate earnings. That means corporations that can't meet the interest payments on their debt or, you know, commercial, commercial real estate or, or whatever. And that's how you get defaults on debt and so-called credit events, right? Mm. So I think the data that everyone should be watching and the big risk to our reflation thesis is that the labor market gives out. And there is some reason to think that's possible. If you look at the, the, the majority of the labor market data in aggregate, the labor market is clearly softening. So if you looked at average uh, weekly hours worked, it's at a cycle low. That's typically a leading indicator for, say, the payrolls data. If you look at temporary payrolls, uh, they were down 30,000 uh, net last month. They've been declining for you know a while now. Uh, if you look at uh, you know various cyclical sectors, interest rate sensitive sectors within the labor market, they've been relatively weak. Um, you could, uh, if you look at um, job openings, right? They're at a new cycle low. Quit rates at a new cycle low. If you look at the Kansas City Fed's index of labor market conditions, which is a great index that kind of combines a lot of these things that I'm talking about, it's clearly exhibiting pretty strong negative momentum. And the reason this matters is because all this labor market data that I'm referencing tends to be auto-correlated, which means it exhibits strong trend. When it's going up, it tends to continue to go up. When it you know, turns down and starts going down, it tends to continue going down. Right now, it's going down. So the question is, is it going to continue going down and cause the US to go into a recession? And cause a credit event like you're describing, or is the easing of financial market conditions that we've seen, you know, this 100 basis point decline in interest rates, stock market uh, running up close to new highs, will that easing of financial conditions be enough to turn uh, the momentum in the labor market around or at least stop it, at least cause it to go sideways, right? At least cause it to stop going down. And Victor's were inclined to think the answer is yes. And one piece of evidence for that is um, the most recent homebuilders report which is a little dated at this point, but it was for November. And But what we saw was very interesting. We saw home builders grow new starts 18% month over month, which is really, really fast, right? So when you see that, you think, uh, well, first of all, 
to set the stage. Residential construction employment tends to be a leading indicator within the payrolls data. It had been weak leading into that report. But what you saw was tremendous responsiveness from the home builders to lower interest rates in November, right? And so uh, if they're growing new projects 18% month over month, you have to think, are they going to be laying off their workers or are they going to be adding payrolls to meet this new demand? And I think the answer is that they're probably going to be adding payrolls. And that's actually what we saw in December. We saw home builders adding new payrolls. They weren't laying people off anymore. And so I think the highest frequency data that we have suggests that labor market conditions are stabilizing and, and possibly getting ready to start improving. I mean, and also say that, look, the non-farm payrolls data from December increased to 216,000 month over month. That was like a three or four month high. Uh, which is just to say it's it's more incremental evidence that labor market conditions might be improving on the margins. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I, yeah, the, the comments on the housing starts up 18% month over month since November. Is that, did I hear that? There yeah, is November versus October. So there is 18% November versus month. October. Housing starts right. up 18%, obviously positive for the labor market. You also mentioned earlier, you know, housing uh, was a demand was down 42% from the peak. What, total what was transactions. Total, total transactions. transactions. So new, new home sales plus existing home sales are down 42% from their five-year high. From their five-year high. Got it. Okay. Um, and inside of that, you know, you could say there's some severe, probably some serious pent-up demand, right? Which is um, potentially going to whiplash here. Right. Interesting. Okay. Okay. So, so... Uh, S and P probably up 10, 20 percent, regardless. Bullish, quite, quite bullish on S and P twenty twenty four. Housing similar as a consequence of uh, pent up demand and now uh, reduced mortgage rates, inspiring people to get back into the market. Home builders have recognized this, and they're now putting product out they hadn't been for a while, and now they're putting more product back on the shelf. Uh, that's going to take some time. And so I think maybe if the uh, home buyer's appetite returns prior to new inventory hitting the street. I, I don't know if you if you mm -hmm. think that balance weighs in at all to uh, to the bullish sentiment, or maybe I'm overthinking it. Um, if I misinterpreted anything there, let me know. Otherwise, where do you land? Do you, do you track you know, alternative assets, things like cryptocurrencies? Are you looking at the rally in the crypto markets and investor interest and demographic spread and all this? What's your take there, Mike? Not not quite as much time as we spend in the stock market. Right. Uh, and, we, and we evaluate crypto more from a macro perspective, more in terms of the economic data that it tends to track over time. And I like... I, I could talk about housing uh, and other alternatives as well if you would if you'd like later. For crypto, I would say cri crypto is just the quintessential risk on asset. It has a very strong positive correlation with all growth data. It has a very strong positive correlation with all the monetary policy data. So, what are the backdrops, the, the macroeconomic backdrops in which crypto tends to do very very well? It tends to do really really well through reflations, and it tends to do really really well when the Fed is easing, or at least when interest rates are stable, mm -hmm. right? Currently, we expect uh, economic growth and inflation to accelerate, and we expect the Fed to either be on pause or to be cutting, right, basically. And that's a backdrop in which crypto tends to do very well. So unless something changes to cause us to adjust our outlook, I think we're biased to the bullish side on crypto. We're looking to buy the dips. I don't think it's unreasonable that Bitcoin could be at $60,000 by the end of the year mm -hmm. or at some point dur during the year. So, um, yeah, I think... Bullish crypto until something changes. Do you track the gold market at all? Yeah, yeah, more or less the same way. I think you've got to be well. So I think gold is a little bit more complicated. On the one hand, I think as a, as a solo trade, it's frustrated a lot of people, right? Because it's been trying to digest this this resistance around twenty fifty a coin or around twenty fifty an ounce, and uh, it just can't seem to break out. And everyone's like, "Wow, we've had inflation, we've had geopolitical instability." Like, why can't it break out? And I think that the answer is that I'm sure that you, this isn't news to you, but gold trades with a very close inverse correlation to real interest rates. Real interest rates have been rising, and that's been a massive headwind for the price of gold. So in a sense, we shouldn't be surprised that gold has been frustrating as a long only trade. That said, I think you have to compare gold to its alternatives. And really, gold trades more like a bond than like a commodity, right? I just cited that inverse relationship with the real interest rate. That's to say gold trades a lot like tips. 
But if you were to compare gold to its uh, closest alternative, let's say the 10-year note, uh, gold has performed much, much better. Since the beginning of 2021, when we saw interest rates start to rise, right? Gold is up, I think about 8%, and the 10-year note is down 30% or something like that, right? Gold has vastly outperformed its alternative. So if you were long gold short treasuries, right? That was like a big short caliber blowout trade. I mean, you've crushed it. So, um, you know, gold, gold hasn't done as badly as it seems on the surface. And then I would also add like, look, when these historical relationships decouple, right? When you see gold performing better than it should, given its historical relationship with interest rates, that makes me bullish, right? Because I think when interest rates eventually do start to decline and who knows when that'll be, right? That is going to be more gas in the tank for the bull market that gold uh, eventually goes on. So um, if I'm just, if I have a long only book, I'm waiting for gold to break out above 2050. If I run a more complicated book with long short positions and I'm flexing gross exposure up and down, um, I think gold is interesting. With strong economic conditions, does that, does that temper your enthusiasm around an asset like gold? As a standalone trade, yes, generally, right? If the economy is becoming more productive, if real growth is accelerating, generally that means uh, there's an opportunity cost to owning gold, right? When the economy is doing well, you want to own productive stuff. And when the economy is slowing, generally gold does better. Yeah, got it, got it. Okay, um, outside of you know uh, gold, I suppose, other commodities, you're looking at the copper market. Um, we touched on energy a little bit. Any other hard commodities in your purview, Mike? The commodity that stands out as being interesting right now to me is oil, right? Okay. I think that oil is right above support at $70 a barrel or so, right? I think it's very possible that oil trades back up to $100 over the next three to six months. A lot of people don't realize this, but oil is an incredibly important input into pretty much everything from you know your Canada goose jacket to your skis to mm. the asphalt in your driveway to the roofing on your house to uh, you know, cosmetics, to, to pharmaceuticals, to all of the durable goods that I mentioned earlier in the conversation. So furniture and home appliances and whatnot. I mean, oil is a, an incredibly important input cost. And as a consequence of that, the price of oil tends to track the US manufacturing cycle and the global manufacturing cycle very closely. So if you looked at the PMI data or the industrial production data, and you overlaid uh, the year over year change in the price of oil, they look really, really similar. And so given that we expect manufacturing activity and the growth cycle to sort of reignite in 2024, that gives us an upward bias in terms of evaluating oil. And um, we think $100 is a, is a reasonable price target. And needless to say, given oil's leading correlation with the inflation data, if we do see $100 oil, the conversation around inflation and monetary policy is going to be very different. So I think uh, we did the math on this recently. If oil hits $100 by, I think it was June, it would imply headline CPI of 3.9%, you know, all else held constant, which it never is. But uh, it's a good way of setting your expectations. If we saw $100 oil, that would put upward pressure on CPI inflation towards something closer to 4%. And we don't think that scenario is out of the question at all. And that's not even allowing for things like supply shocks mm -hmm. or uh, more geopolitical instability. This is This thesis is really just predicated based on the uh, reflationary impulse uh, enabled by the decline in interest rates that we've already seen. Mm. Okay. Okay. I appreciate that. Mike, where, where can I send anybody if they want to hear more of what you have to say and more of what you're looking at? So uh, we're at Invictus-Research.com. Uh, we have a number of different products. Our flagship product is probably the Daily Edge. It's a five to 10 minute video that goes out every morning. Uh, lots of intuitive charts and graphs. The goal is to take the prior day's economic data, explain it in very accessible language. Um, you know, dispense with all of the all of the industry jargon and 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 put the data in the context of the business cycle and to make it kind of interesting and, and fun along the way. And you can also find our work at Invictus Macro on Twitter. Yeah. Okay. Look, I want to thank you for coming on today and uh, chatting with me and opening up the. The, the curtain on where you're putting cash and where you're looking for opportunity, Mike. I appreciate it. My pleasure, Jay. Thank you for having me. All right. Commodity investing for beginners. No complex strategies, just actionable information. 
Our comprehensive course breaks down the complexities so you can make informed decisions and gain financial freedom.